Hello, thanks for joining us. This is Space Nuts. My name is Andrew Dunkley, your host. It's great to be with you. Coming up, we're going to talk about Fred. Yes, we are. Uh, he's been away, but he's back. You mightn't have even noticed that he wasn't in, but uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, true. it's true. We'll also be talking about the Psyche mission that's due to launch any minute now. And uh, Fred's got a, a real personal connection with this one. Hmm. And the Euclid telescope uh, seems to have run into some issues, but maybe they've solved them. It's the FGS, which is better than an LOS, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> yes. Uh, also, we will be uh, hearing from Bo about maximum entropy, John about the early universe, and Al about dark energy. That's all coming up on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining us to talk about all of that and so much more is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hi there, Fred. Um, hello, Andrew. How are you? I'm good. You look well. I haven't seen you for a month. Most people are going, what is he talking about? Yes, been on every right. week. And but we had to do eight episodes in like three or four <laughs> weeks to cover the fact that I was away and then you were away and now we're back and now we're going to do two more because, because I'm away again. Away. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Uh, but um, there you go. probably no need to explain it because everyone's going, no, no, the episodes are there. You must have been home. <laughs> so tell us about your trip. Where did you go? What did you do? Well, did you meet it was anyone famous aside from yourself. You meet yes. someone famous every day in the mirror. Uh, I met somebody infinitely more famous, uh, certainly than me, and probably even <laughs> you as well. Oh, uh, definitely, because uh, so this was uh, the. It's a, a kind of two pronged absence. Uh, three weeks of my absence were on one of Marnie's tours, uh, which was of the UK, beginning in the Channel Islands, uh, which are nearer to France than they are to Britain, and then ending in the Shetland Islands, which are nearer to Norway than they are to Britain. Uh, nearly, actually, it's about the same distance. But yeah, wonderful stuff all the way. So we had a group of about uh, 20 people. Um, the Channel Islands, marvellous, lovely weather. Also interesting history there because... Not only are there fortifications everywhere against the Napoleonic uh, invaders in the early 19th century, but there's a lot of um, World War II stuff as well, because, mm. uh, as you probably know, the Channel Islands were actually occupied by Germany during World War II. I only wasn't aware of that. On the bit of Britain that was. Uh, and then we were up through Cornwall, uh, took in a lot of really interesting history there, went to Land's End, went to That's the That's where my family comes from. Ah, uh, is it the Dunkleys? Ah, yes. should have should have known that. I'd have mm. looked them up. Uh, we we did look up uh, the site of where Doc Martin is filmed uh, for our Doc Martin fans on the, on the show uh, on the sorry on the uh, on the trip. A uh, bit of astronomy to the Goonhilly uh, uh, Earth Station, which is a satellite communication station which has mm. been there since 1962 i remember when it was built uh that's um that's somewhere i've never never visited before so we saw that then into wales so amazing stuff a, a stone age burial site as well as much more recent castles and things of that so we were in bath at the william herschel museum which is the place where the planet uranus was discovered stood yeah, on the spot in the garden in the rain i loved bath when we yeah what a, what a lovely place it is isn't it yeah mm. it's a stunning city uh, and it was in bath that we were joined for the rest of the tour by our world famous uh, guest uh, dame jocelyn bell burnell the discoverer of pulsars back wow. in 1967 and uh, when, when we got to wales actually jocelyn gave us a lovely talk a public talk which drew people from all over wales to come and hear her speaking as you would mm -hmm. with somebody that famous so uh, jocelyn was de a delight accompanied us the rest of the Rest of the way, we took in the Beatles Museum in Liverpool. <laughs> we were at Jodrell Bank, the iconic radio telescope yeah. uh, near Manchester, and then up to Shetland, which was kind of the focus of what we were doing because we were trying to make the connection between Bronze Age stuff, which of which there is quite a lot in Shetland, as well as Iron Age and uh, other uh, more recent historical artefacts. But there is also... Uh, 
one of the UK's spaceports, the most northerly spaceport in Britain, is at a place called Saxavord, right on the northern tip of Shetland. So we're up there looking at what's being done there. They actually have um, already have one launch pad uh, completed, and they've done test flat firings from that, uh, but have not yet launched a space vehicle. But that is expected to happen before the end of this year. So watch out for the Saxavord spaceport. We will probably talk about it again, and it's a delight to have been there and uh, explored Fantastic. what it's like. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine building a spaceport and particularly a launch pad is is super duper technical. It wouldn't be like laying a driveway at a house. You'd There'd be so much more that goes into it. There, there is, and there's an added dimension uh, with uh, this particular one because halfway through the construction of all this, they discovered a Bronze Age uh, memorial burial site. Oh. So yeah, As you had do. to get all the ar- archaeologists flooded in. Uh, yeah. But the spaceport is actually privately run, a privately oh, run okay. venture, and they are really enthusiastic about the fact that they've now now got a Bronze Age burial site on their territory, as well as uh, a few Space Age uh, things. In fact, they said there's a nice quote from the guy who is the CEO mm. of the spaceport. Uh, he said, because there's a lot of Viking remains there as well, and he said, our mantra used to be from long ships to spaceships, oh. but now it's from the Bronze Age to the Space Age. Oh, that's so, a good one too. Quite that nice. work. Yeah, they yeah. do both work. I, yeah. I wonder how many times these sorts of projects, not just astronomy, but uh, or spaceports, but you know, projects in general, they they do a bit of digging and go, oh, hello, what's? Don't tell. Don't tell anybody. Do back. <laughs> yeah, don't tell anybody. I think that. Yeah, I think that happens. Yeah, I bet it happens. Yeah. Um, it's uh, and it's something you have to be very careful about. We. Uh, Uh, in the Department of Industry, of course, have uh, responsibility for uh, the Australian end of the Square Kilometre Array Observatory. And one of the things that was that was not done uh, was exactly what you've just described, because the you know the, the fact that there are probably sacred sites on that country, uh, and some of my colleagues, along with the Wadri people who own the own the the area, uh, they actually walked over the 65 kilometres of this uh, of this site for the square kilometre array, uh, looking precisely for that for any sacred sites, any particular, you know, sites of significance, yeah. uh, which was incredible. One of my colleagues um, is a specialist on that, and it's amazing to talk to him and find out what lengths they went to to get all this right. Mm. Most importantly, though, Fred, on your trip, did you manage to run into Duncan from Weymouth? Do you know I didn't? Um, I, um, I, as I mentioned, I think at the time uh, when we last heard from Duncan, uh, we were passing through his territory. But it turned out that there was no way of actually stopping, uh, oh. or, or even uh, it, it was a, a, a long transfer from. Uh, from oh, that's a good point from Southampton uh, right down to. Penzance, which is near Land's End, and there was no way of stopping anywhere except at motorway services. Oh, right. Well, <laughs> maybe another day. Maybe I think I'm... I think Duncan will. I'll, I'll, I'll keep him posted though, uh, because it's very nice to know we've got somebody who listens to us in Weymouth. He might not be doing anymore. And I'm sure he is. I'm sure he is. He's always got questions for us, and I'm sure we'll hear from Duncan again. That's very good. now, Fred. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, topics to discuss. I think we'll start with the Euclid telescope uh, issue because it's been um, it's it happened to Hubble, it happened to James Webb, and now it's happened to the Euclid telescope. This is the one that was set up by the European Space Agency, Indeed. and it's got a very, very intense mission ahead of it. And they've, they've been doing the tests, and they found a problem with the FGS, the Fine Guidance Sensor, uh, which I, which sounds very important. Um, it is. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. It's what mm. lets you point the telescope in the right direction. Yes. Uh, and so uh, there was a there was an issue. And the, the thing is that uh, Andrew, with a, a telescope like this, which is a survey telescope, um, it's basically mapping the sky. And w- we've done that with um, you know telescopes I've been involved with uh, here in Australia. And what you're keen to do is not lose any time. Uh, between observations, you, 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 you're mapping one bit of the sky with your telescope. Usually, we, we used to use photography; that's gone now. But uh, and it's all electronic detection. But what you don't want to do is then spend half an hour looking for the next bit of sky that you're supposed to be observing. 
yeah. um, and locking onto the stars that let you guide your instruments. And that was the issue uh, with the uh, the FGS, uh, that it wasn't working. Uh, and because Euclid needs to zap to a new uh, field of view every uh, basically every hour and a quarter, um, they, uh, they they had to get this right. Uh, using guide stars, uh, by the way, that came from another ESA mission, the Gaia mission, which is a very accurate astrometry mission, one that lets you measure the positions of stars in the sky with incredible accuracy. Uh, it's fairly easy uh, for our listeners and viewers to go on the web and find what the uh, images were looking like when the fine guidance uh, sensor was failing because there's all these trails of star images uh, which look like a complete random walk in the sky. The telescope's clearly looking for something and not finding it. So it's just like somebody's drawn scribbly lines on a piece of paper. Mm. Um, but um, that's now been cured. Uh, the, the issue, uh, I'm, I'm not actually sure what it is. I think it was to do uh, with um, it's something that we, we used to have trouble with on terrestrial telescopes, uh, and that's cosmic rays. Uh, so um, cosmic rays is something we know, uh, subatomic particles that come down from the universe. Uh, they, If they hit one of these electronic sensors, they, they cause a flash or a little oh. line. Uh, and we had terrible problems getting rid of those, certainly with one of the instruments that I was involved with. Uh, it was uh, a long, drawn-out problem. We were worried that we were going to have to put the whole thing in a lead casing to stop these cosmic rays coming through because mm. there was so much sort of, you know, interference on the uh, on the on the screen. And I think it's been the same problem uh, with the fine guidance system uh, of the Euclid instrument. And I think they have now led to, uh, you know, that they've corrected that basically by a software update to the telescope's control yeah, I think system. They, I think they're calling it a software patch. That's right, yeah. They must we, have got uh, yeah. advice from um, iPhone 15 technicians. <laughs> <laughs> have you got software patches on iPhone 15? Yeah, I've had one. I've had an iPhone 15 for a bit over a week, and I think I've had two software updates already. Have you really? Have you <laughs> yes. really? Yes. Mm. Yeah. And my wife got the 15, I got the 15 Pro, and hers has been overheating, which has been in the news. Oh, but that's a worry. They've that patched worry. that as well. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, software patches are things that you can apply that, I mean, in your case, it might, or in your wife's case, it might well have been to do with the charging rate or the, uh, or the sure. you know, the, the discharging rate that might need software control. It was something different for Euclid, but the good news is it's fixed. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Now, uh, let's um, remind everybody what Euclid's uh, mission is. It's got a big job. It's going to be scanning the night sky and changing its observations every 75 minutes as it um, scans the universe. Uh, it's out there in that uh, Lagrange point yep. uh, well, where it um, will sit and spin and carry on like a pork chop. But it'll, um, it'll, it's got one of the most intriguing missions, I think, of the modern era. That that's correct. So it's it's got you know it's it's doing what we've been doing for a while from terrestrial observatories, but doing it in a big way. So it's it's measuring. Um, billions of galaxies uh and essentially um you know this this there's, there's two points to this that one is mapping the position of the galaxies and the other is looking at their shapes as well uh, because that tells you about uh, gravitational lensing uh so what you what you will end up with we hope uh after i've forgotten when the uh, remember we did talk about this so the sort of I think it was 2027 we're going to get some results back from this mission because it's something that takes time to do. Uh, yeah. We'll get the most up-to-date or the, the, the best 3D map of the wider universe uh, that we've ever had. Uh, but its real function is looking at the, the way uh, the universe has been expanding over the last 10 billion years or so. Mm. Uh, and from that, teasing out information about those two big mysteries – dark matter and dark energy, both of which affect, affect the way galaxies are distributed in the universe. Mm. And so um, hopefully by the end of it, we'll have a much better clue about the way these two phenomena behave. Whether it tells us what they are or not 
It's yeah. another matter. Indeed. <laughs> Speaking of which, there was a story recently, uh, a, a group of Australian scientists uh, uh, have put forward evidence that they say strongly supports dark photons. Yes, that's right. Dark uh, photons. Yep. Yeah. I saw that what story. Are they, what are they talking about there? So um, this is, you're absolutely right, it's a, a Australian led. Uh, and what uh, the story is about is to do with the sub, you know, the suite of subatomic particles that we know exist, uh, and in particular, there's been focus on the muon, and there is an issue with the magnetic field of the muon that is not understood. Uh -huh. uh, but if you postulate that the universe contains, as part of its dark matter suite whose nature we don't know. Mm. But if you postulate that some of that is dark photons, that means an equivalent to, to a photon, but but a, um, an invisible one, one that belongs to the dark universe, if I can put it that way. If you postulate the existence of dark photons, the issue with the muon magnetic field disappears. And so um, and they say that they've, they've, this discovery suggests the existence of dark photons with actually a really high degree of confidence. I think they said it was a six sigma result, which is um, uh, just a shorthand way of saying it's very likely. Yeah. Uh, but they haven't, this, they haven't yet found a dark photon. What they found is perhaps a mathematical proof that dark photons exist. Uh, now, whether a mathematical proof is good enough for what we you know, what we think of in the dark universe, uh, that's a different matter. But I think this is work that will continue to go on. And yeah, dark photons, quite exciting. I think you and I have talked about them before, Andrew. We might have. I, I'm, I'm starting to think there's probably going to be a dark equivalent to everything. Everything. Yes, that's right. The, the, you a, know, a dark like... thread, a dark everything. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. Don't go near the dark Fred. Can't imagine. He's, an, he's an angry, at large. An angry Fred. <laughs> Can't imagine it. Um, you mentioned muons. I, I know what they are. They're, where we've moved, there's a cat across the road and it's, it, it gets its muon. Uh, it, it sounds like someone strangling a chook. <laughs> the poor thing. Oh, I'll record dear. it one day. You've got to hear it. Yeah, I've never sounds... heard anything like it. Yeah. Mm. But uh, yes, all right. And um, back to the Euclid mission. We watch with interest, but it's good to know they've got the bugs out. This is Space Nuts, Andrew Dunkley with Professor Fred Watson. Okay, let's just take a little break from the show to tell you about our sponsor, NordVPN. Now, I've talked about NordVPN many times, a virtual private network. It is such a great asset to have in your arsenal to stop all that nasty stuff that happens uh, on the internet. And we've all been victims of it. Spyware, spam, um, you may have been hacked. Uh, you may even have your details on the dark web. Uh, censorship is an issue, geo-blocking, uh, malware. Gosh, it's, um, it's a nasty list, isn't it? Uh, but NordVPN can protect you from that. Now, how do you get onto NordVPN? You type in nordvpn.com and then hit slash space nuts because as a space nuts listener, you get a special deal. So enter that and it will bring up uh, an interface where you can learn more about NordVPN and the offer available to you. Now, the first thing you'll notice is there's an exclusive deal. Uh, if you buy NordVPN uh, through us now, you get four extra months with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And you can go down through the list and, and look at some of the information attached to your computer that Nord picks up uh, just by uh, interfacing with them. Now, if you want to click Get NordVPN, it shows you all the packages that are available and all the services. Now, I've, I've mentioned some of the things that you've got to look out for online. Nord does that for you. Now, I, I use it. I use Nord every day. I use. Uh, I particularly love their uh, password system. Uh, all my passwords and usernames are stored in what's called the cross-platform password manager. Uh, it is encrypted. No one can hack it. It's uh, attached to a master password system, and it really does sort of put everything in one place so you never have to remember anything except your master password. So it's um, it's brilliant. I, that's my favorite thing of all. But uh, I, I use malware protection. I use the tracker and the ad blocker. Uh, of course, high-speed VPN. And I still don't know how they get higher speeds than my 
uh, internet service provider actually provides, but it does happen. Um, you can get one terabyte of cloud storage. It just depends what level of service you want to go. There's a standard, a uh, plus service, and the complete package. Now, if you go with a monthly plan, it costs a little bit more. There's a one-year plan, or if you go the two-year plan, it costs less per month over a longer period. Uh, but go and have a look at it for yourself. I honestly uh, think it's the best in the business, and they uh, they are working very hard to make the internet a safer place for everybody. Uh, that's their mantra. So uh, jump online, nordvpn.com slash space nuts, and get the deal because it is really worthwhile. And you've got a 30-day money-back guarantee if you're not happy. That's nordvpn.com slash space nuts. Now back to the show. Okay, we checked all four systems and being with a go. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, uh, this is an exciting mission as well. And as we speak, yeah. uh, maybe it's already happened for some people who are slow downloaders. Uh, yeah. you, you know, you can go beyond dial up. If, if you, <laughs> if there are things out there that are a bit quicker. But uh, yes, the um, Psyche mission. This is a, a mission that NASA's put on to go out and visit uh, this, this asteroid. Uh, because it's different, it's metallic. And this is one you've got a connection with. You studied this before we knew exactly what it was. I did, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it, um, it, back in the 70s, actually, when I was doing my master's degree at St. Andrews, my degree was about or the orbits of asteroids. Uh, and Psyche was one of the asteroids whose orbit I studied. Uh, it was asteroid number 16, so we called it 16. And I saw the results to Fred's test, and he went... It does orbit. Yes, that was it. That was the answer. It goes around the sun. Got a hundred percent for that. Hundred um, percent. But what we've learned since, uh, as you said, is that the asteroid Psyche is possibly, maybe even probably, but possibly the the central core of a, pla a planetesimal, an object that was going to be a planet but yeah. never made it. Um, and you know the. Uh, the, the way planets eventually come into being is by accretion, things banging into each other, uh, and that includes the stony material and the metallic ma material. But with the heat that's generated by those collisions as planets are forming, the, uh, the, the metallic material, which is mostly iron, sinks to the center under its mm -hmm. own gravity. It just pulls itself to into a blob in the middle of one of these molten uh, planetesimals. Um, and we think what's happened is that uh, Quite early on in the history of the solar system, something has banged into this planetesimal and basically sheared off its uh, its outer stony mantle and yeah. left the metallic core. So you're quite right. Uh, we have a launch date uh, in US time of the 12th of October. Uh, that's probably the 13th for us here in Australia. Um, the spacecraft of the same name uh, will be launched uh, towards the asteroid Psyche. Uh, and it's a fairly long trip as well. It's not something that's going to happen next week. The arrival there, uh, it will blast off, as I said, October 12th uh, at uh, the that's US Eastern Daylight Time. Um, and then we'll have to go to, sorry, 3.5 billion kilometers. <laughs> uh, and it's got a, it's actually got a gravity assist uh, uh, maneuver somewhere in there. I can't remember which. Uh, which planet it's going to get a jump from? It's probably Jupiter. I should check that, shouldn't I, before mm. I start speaking? But there is a there is a gravity assist uh, mission uh, maneuver, at least one involved, and eventually uh, uh, the spacecraft, the Psyche spacecraft, will arrive at Psyche, the asteroid, uh, in 2029. Psyche is kind of on the far edge of the main belt. It's um, it's towards towards Jupiter rather than towards Mars, and mm. then we'll see images of what this strange object looks like. So it is, it's very exciting, especially for somebody yeah, who studied yeah. the asteroid in his youth. So what, what exactly are they hoping to glean from this? I mean, we, we've just recently seen the return of uh, some asteroid dust. Yes, uh, that's right. Which um, was from a, you know, a rocky, icy asteroid. What, what are they hoping to find in regard to this one? Well, there's um, there, there are mysteries with uh, with this, psyche. This is sixteen psyche, isn't it? Yes, that sixteen. It's asteroid number. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's right. It's, it's, so asteroids 
after the first one was discovered series in 1801, uh, it took a little while before people realized that that wasn't just a planet. It was one of a large number of objects, but very quickly these were all numbered in, and so they're numbered in uh, in chronological order. So I think uh, 16 Psyche was discovered in the 18 somethings, 1852. 50, 50, 52. I was close. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so it's, uh, but the, the, the thing that's interesting about it is that um, when you look at, so you can, you can actually investigate to some extent the material of its surface by looking at the spectrum of the object that tells you, especially in the infrared, it will mm. tell you about the chemistry on the surface of a, an asteroid. And and there are there are differences between Psyche and what we see on other asteroids. Um, so things like iron oxides, which are present in most of the inner solar system, uh, and we've wanted to look at Mars to see iron oxide displayed in a very red nature. Um, there's nothing like that on Psyche. Mm. And it's interesting because if you've got something that's mostly made of iron uh, and it's and you you put it in the presence of oxygen, which will be certainly in the in the uh, you know the nebula that uh, the solar system formed from, you would expect to see these oxides, but apparently you don't. Uh, and so it, this is leading people to to speculate that maybe Psyche might uh, tell us things about the evolution of formation and evolution of planets that, that at the moment that we're missing. Uh, you know, there might be a, additional steps in it that we don't really know about, or or that it's or that there are two ways of making planets rather than just the one that we you know we all talk about. So uh, that will be what Psyche will do. It's, um, I think, as a, far as I remember, it will be in orbit around Psyche um, and will basically analyze it to death. Uh, yes, its orbits are something like 700 kilometers and it will get closer and closer mm. uh, in, uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the asteroid uh, and eventually will, you know, so it'll be able to pick up um, sort of things like gamma rays from the surface, which will give you all kinds of uh, in interesting insights into what the surface is about. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I hope you and I last on Space Nuts to 2029 so we could talk about all this. Yeah, it's be very exciting. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, 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 uh, they're not landing anything on it or taking trying to get no, a sand um, or anything? As I, as I understand it, it is, uh, it is a, a, a basically... A, uh, an orbital mission with with no lander, mm -hmm. uh, but but being orbited by something that's festooned with state of the art instrumentation, yeah, uh, gamma ray neutron spectrometer. Whoa, this is high tech stuff. <laughs> I think it's going to spend like half a year in orbit before it's completed its mission. Something. Yes, like that. yes, that's right. Yes, mm -hmm. the, they've got. Um, uh, what they call different orbital regimes uh, named A and B. Uh, so the first, uh, the A orbital regime is 56 day orbits, and that's going to be looking for a magnetic field, uh, which would be really interesting uh, because if it has a magnetic field, it probably tells you that once it was part of a, something that was going to become a planet. Uh, and then uh, the, the the other orbital regimes are, are um, basically... Uh, uh, much, much, um, much longer. I'm sorry, I, I, I misled you there. The orbital regime lasts for 56 days. It's not an orbit period of 56 days. Uh, uh, these will be these will be uh, much shorter than that. Yes, of course. Um, do we know how big 16 Psyche is? I suppose we do. Uh, yeah, it's a matter of um, what is it? 100, 100 dish or 200 uh, kilometers. 279 kilometers there you are oh it's a shaped big like, one shaped like a potato yeah it is yeah so well you know for it to be the 16th asteroid discovered it would have to be and it is on the far side of the asteroid belt so it it has to be a big object to reflect enough light for telescopes in 1852 to actually detect it <laughs> well if it's made of metal it'd be pretty shiny um, it's 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 uh, it's not hard to imagine what a meta a metal asteroid will look like, isn't it? But yeah. my guess is it's not shiny at all. I think it'll be um, it it might look like um, I don't know maybe a, a freshly laid 
road tar surface or something like yeah. that. Uh, hard to hard to estimate. Well, I mean, you can look online and find artists' impressions of what psyche might be like, but we really don't know. What happens to the spaceship when the mission's over? Um, as far as I know, it will continue in orbit around Psyche. It'll uh, just I stay there, become part of the asteroid belt. Yes, that's right. I don't think there's a plan to um, to collide with uh, with the object itself because well, they might change their mind. They might. They might change their mind. That's right. <laughs> you know what? You know, astronomers, just like <laughs> tradesmen, love crashing into things, <laughs> are smashing stuff up, as you know. So, well, yeah, we. Yeah, that absolutely. Smashing up is part and parcel of what we do. <laughs> yes, absolutely true. Uh, and by the way, uh, the slingshot is around Mars. Yes, I yes. I think that, that makes sense because it's going that way. Uh, yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, lots to learn, but not in a hurry because we um, we won't see it arrive until August of 2029. So um, hold your breaths and we'll get back to you shortly. <laughs> This is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account. Where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Hello, saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Zero G and I feel fine. Space nuts. Okay, Fred, uh, let's tackle a few questions. Got a whole bunch because we've sort of not been able to talk for a while and we've got uh, squillions of them. And with episode 375 not far away, we'll have plenty of ammunition for our uh, Q&A program when we get to it. But um, let's just uh, tackle a few audio questions. Our first one comes from Bo. Hello, Fred and Andrew. It's uh, Bo here from Melbourne in Australia. I love your show. I've got uh, a correction, a question, and a dad joke for you. Uh, first of all, the correction. Um, the name of the Chinese moon lander program is pronounced Chang'e, not Chang'e, because that's the place in Singapore, but it's pronounced Chang'e, like an ER with the upward inflection. Um, if you can please refer to that in the future episode, that'd be great. And of course, Chang'e is the moon goddess in Chinese mythology. Um, on to my question, what happened to time and space? when the universe reaches its maximum entropy. Um, I would assume there'll be no gravity because there's no matter, therefore there'll be no light, no energy as such. But what happened to time and space itself? Does that evaporate or cease to exist? And if so, how do you actually know you've reached maximum entropy because there's no space as such? Anyway, that's just a thought. Um, as for the dad joke, well, can't remember because it's uh, not apparent. Buntish. Thank you very much. Love your show. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Bo. Uh, and uh, yeah, Chang Er, I will try and remember, but don't quote me on that because I'm terrible at remembering these things. Uh, but yes, thank you for the correction. Time and space and maximum entropy. So, what yes, are we talking so, about here. So, uh, maximum disorder. Uh -huh. um, uh, and the the um, it, it's, it's, it, Bo raises a really interesting point, which I've never really kind of thought about because, uh, as as I guess, he's implying the as the universe uh, continues to expand, and we think it's going to always be expanding because dark energy seems to force that expansion to increase. Uh, its velocity so that uh, we've got an accelerating universe. Um, I th uh, th so the entropy is always going to be increasing. Uh, and so a time of maximum entropy would 
really correspond to a time when the universe had reached its final state. Oh. And we don't really know what that is because uh, there have been suggestions that there may be a big rip uh, so that space itself uh, somehow uh, gets full of imperfections and tears. Uh, that certainly would um, constitute an increase in entropy. Uh, so I think uh, the end point of entropy is really the end point of the universe. And the, the universe doesn't seem to have an end point. It seems, it seems to be an infinitely uh, re, uh, you know, expanding entity. Um, well, it'll eventually run out of hydrogen fuel, so star formation will stop, uh, and stars will burn out. They will usually turn into black holes or white dwarfs, uh, which uh, the black white dwarfs will eventually turn into black dwarfs, which are just inert lumps. Uh, white uh, black holes can evapor evaporate eventually. So, you know, perhaps in many hundreds of billions or even trillions of years, we might find that the black holes have all evaporated. Meanwhile, entropy is continued, continuing to increase. So um, we've got uh, uh, a situation where there might never be a maximum point of entropy. It's always going to be more entropic than it was the day before. I mean, so does that mean time and space will continue until they stop? Um, who, who knows? Because ta time began at the moment of the Big Bang. That's, that's right. what, yes, that's what relativity demonstrates. Says, yeah. Um, and if you've got you know an expansion that's going to go on infinitely, unless if if there is such a thing as a big rip, and and some um, cosmologists do talk about that, then maybe that will rip time as well. Mm. So how do you, you know, time Time we know distorts because we see relativity, relativistic effects and we can measure those. We know that time can bend, but whether it can rip uh, and therefore become the end of time, who knows? You're very profound have, questions, Paul. It, yeah, they are. It, you'd have to have some kind of substance to have something rip though, wouldn't you? I mean, well... But that's the issue that, you know, there isn't a substance. It's space time. You know, it's the fabric of space, whatever yeah. that is. It's uh, not a we, fabric we use at all, that, it's... We use that term glibly, that's right, because it isn't a fabric at all. Mm. But it does have structure because that is what actually bends for, you know, for um, with gravitational lensing, for example. It's the structure of space that's bending. Yeah, okay. I just heard that cat. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, it's actually our, our puppy uh, I know. complaining that so something's coming up the driveway. <laughs> That'll do it. They're good alarm clocks and they're yeah. very, very good guard dogs sometimes. Uh, did we cover everything? Yes. Um, I, I'd really appreciate uh, Bo's comment on Chang'e as well because um, I, I have not put that inflection at the end, Chang'e. <laughs> Chang'e. Well, I've been yeah. way off the mark. I, yeah, I, apparently I went to Singapore, but um, but that's fine. Uh, that, well, that we is just, right. We too. just revert to simplicity when it comes to trying to decipher foreign languages. No, you should you should have heard my attempts at Spanish over the last week. Uh, <laughs> they were total rubbish. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny how uh, we struggle with other languages, and and the accents kind of mess it up too. Uh, thank you, Bo. Lovely to hear from you. Next is John. Hi, this is John from Madison, Wisconsin. If all of the stuff early at the beginning of the universe was as close together and as dense as I imagine it to be, how did it not all just get trapped inside a big black hole? How did it get away from itself? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, John. Um, we get a lot of questions about the early universe and what happened and why. And yeah, he poses an interesting one. Why didn't it all just sort of, you know, conglomerate and stay where it was and get... Well, maybe it did get trapped in a black hole and we're inside it. Oh, well, that's a theory. I you know, for, yeah. people, some people have postulated the idea of an event horizon sort of at the end of edge of the universe. Um, but I think um, the bottom line... John, though, is that you're absolutely right. The density and temperature in the early universe were unbelievably high. Um, uh, the, the, there was a kind of trigger point at three minutes that allowed um, new, you know, the nuclei of atoms to form. 
so it had cooled down after three minutes enough to to let that happen. But I think the the bottom line is that the uh, expansion of the universe, uh, which was generated by whatever energy you know energy source actually caused the Big Bang itself, because we know it was a very very energetic. Uh, thing, yeah, I've got an audience in there. <laughs> uh, Marty's not doing a very good job of keeping him quiet, but that's because he's <laughs> it's impossible to shut up. Um, so uh, you've got so much energy that uh, what I guess we're saying is that that overcomes the gravitational pull of what, the stuff that's in the universe. Um, so it's always the universe is always going to be a balance between the energy of the Big Bang um, and the what gravitational pull of what's within the universe. And that's why before the discovery of the ac uh, accelerated expansion, that's why we thought the universe would likely collapse on itself because of the gravitational breaking effect of all the matter in it mm. um, that, that finally would overcome the energy that was imparted to the universe by the Big Bang itself, which is what stopped it st forming into a Big Bang to start, uh, sorry, forming into a black hole to start with. Mm. Yeah, I, it's, so hard to get your head around the time scales, but um, yeah, the Big Bang happened. Uh, lots of things happened in very, very short spaces of time. You talk about formation of atoms after three minutes. Well, the 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 thing that's the most rapid, the blink of an eye thing, is the inflation, uh, mm. which started something like ten to the minus thirty three of a second after the Big Bang, and lasted for about the same length of time. <laughs> Meanwhile, the universe went from the size of a football to the size of a galaxy uh, in that uh, you know in that interval. Uh, now that itself must have had an energy source, the inflation, uh, which we believe, uh, you know, and there's really good evidence for believing that that actually happened, that that was a fundamental part of the aftermath of the Big Bang. If yeah. you can call 10 to the minus 33 of a second the aftermath. <laughs> well, uh, um, do, do we know what fueled it, what fired it? No, no idea. Um, the standard story is uh, in the beginning there was nothing, and then it exploded. Yeah. And that's as much as we know. <laughs> it's It's probably one of the biggest, if not the... Absolute biggest mystery of the universe. Yeah, the were we all the were we all there at some stage, or did we sort of you know the bits and bobs that created? Yeah, we were all we were all, we were all part of that. We were stuff. all in there. All, the, all the yes, all the particles that eventually became you and me, except they were they were in a different form because there was the, you know the only nuclei were hydrogen and helium. And, uh, and a few trace elements of lithium and things like that. So we've existed in some form for yeah, 13 the, the point whatever. Eight, for eight billion years, the particles, the particles that made us. That's right. That's why you feel old, Andrew. Yeah, that's why my leg hurts. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, no, the matter didn't get trapped, John, because what was whatever, the answer? <laughs> whatever, whatever exploded the universe was powerful enough to stop it from happening. Well, in other words... In other words, it could overcome gravity. Yeah. Well, if you're talking about an expansion in the milliseconds over the size of a galaxy, that's massive power. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Humongous power. Mm. And so we just call it inflation, which is... Yeah. <laughs> kind of understates it really, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Don't talk about inflation in Australia at the moment. No, that's right. Mm. Okay. Thank you, John. Our final question comes from Big Al. Hello, this is young Al from the Sunshine Coast. If you were to get in, go into a black hole, time slows down according to where we are. And conversely, if we look at the distant universe, it becomes less dense the further away it is, and time speeds up compared to us. They are accelerating. Doesn't this explain dark energy? Ah, okay. Um, well... So we try yeah. to explain dark energy. <laughs> it's as it's, good as um, any. No, it doesn't. Um, no, apparently not. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm trying to, trying be to a, help you there, Al. Yeah, and I'm trying to help you as well, Al. So um, the, the the time dilation phenomenon, um, I don't think, which is real, uh, and there was a paper not two months ago, I think, where that time dilation was observed. 
Uh, I think you and I spoke about it, the yeah. gravitational time dilation uh, at the uh, in the early universe. Uh, I don't think it's. I don't think the phenomena that you're talking about are, uh, are big enough to account for the apparent acceleration of the expanding universe. I think time dilation phenomena are already taken into account when you calculate what the universe is doing. Uh, okay. <laughs> you, Sorry, don't yeah. you don't sound convinced, Andrew. I'm just confused, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did see a story, I think it was even today, I, I happened across a story uh, about a, a study that's suggesting that the majority of the universe is made of dark energy. Yeah, it is. But it is. 70, 75% or something. En energy versus matter, though. Yeah, so so that's when you talk about the mass energy content of the universe because matter and energy are equivalent, equals mc squared. Mm. Uh, and so you lump them all together. So if you're only talking about matter, then we've got normal matter and dark matter, and dark matter outweighs normal matter by about five to one. Right. If you're talking about everything, the, the whole... And mass energy, uh, mass energy budget, or matter energy budget of the universe, then the, the dark energy is by far the biggest. Okay, three quarters of the universe. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and, there you go. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Al. Um, great questions today, and they um, they they were very thought provoking, uh, and we appreciate them. Uh, if you'd like to send us a question, we welcome them. We've got quite a few, but we do tend to run through them pretty rapidly. So please don't hesitate if something pops into your um, uh, expansive brain and you need to know. Fred has all the answers. <laughs> no response. Um, uh, yes, no, I'm um, just writing down uh, what I need to think about. <laughs> So um, if you go to our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io, you can send us a question through the AMA tab or the little thing on the right-hand side where you can click. If you've got a device with a microphone, uh, you're all set. Just uh, don't forget to tell us who you are and where you're from. We like to know. And you can uh, send us your questions anytime you like, 24 hours, seven days a week. We will get to them uh, around about the same time as the Psyche probe arrives at its target. <laughs> 2029 20, August. Yes. So stay tuned. Uh, that's just about it, Fred. Thank you very much. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure, um, mostly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> good to talk to you, Andrew, and uh, look forward to speaking again next week. I'm going to blatant jet lag for that comment. Thank you, Fred, Thank you. and we'll, <laughs> we'll catch you on the next episode. Uh, and thanks to Hugh in the studio, who was, um, yeah, all fit and ready to go today and then press the wrong button, but he eventually caught up. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company. Catch you on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.